Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the seventh webinar uh, in our series for Safe Work Month 2021. Uh, today's session is titled Asbestos and WHS, What You Need to Know. And as usual, we have a panel of learned individuals to uh, hopefully answer some of your questions. And that is the focus of this morning's session is to ask questions. Uh, and we'll hopefully provide you with some responses that can uh, inform you going forward. This morning, we've got Eve Spayers. Eve is an occupational hygienist and has worked internationally in the UK, France and Hong Kong, as well as in Western Australia before joining WorkSafe uh, as an inspector in, 20, uh, sorry, in 2008. Uh, as the principal scientific officer, she manages the occupational health hygiene and noise team, a team of 10 specialist scientific inspectors that covers asbestos matters as well as occupational health and hygiene. We also have Valerie Hall. Val has been with WorkSafe for 21 years, 18 of those within the inspectorate. Prior to joining WorkSafe, she worked um, in local government as an environmental health and safety officer and has plenty of real world asbestos experience, having been part of the department's response to Cyclone Saroja. Uh, and last but not least, we have Bill Mitchell. I'm almost not going to introduce Bill because he's been a regular star of the show uh, this month, but. Bill is the general manager of our WHS uh, legislation project team, uh, and he'll be the one who'll be asking your questions of uh, our specialist inspectors this morning. Okay, thanks for joining us this morning. So as Andrew said, we're gonna be looking at asbestos, and that's, that's actually contained in chapter eight within WHS, within the regulations. So after detailed consideration by the Parliament on the 10th of November 2020, the Work Health and Safety Act, or we refer to that as the WHS Act, received assent. When it's fully enacted, the Act will replace the Occupational Safety and Health Laws, or the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1984, and Work Health and Safety Related Laws currently contained in the Mine Safety and Inspection Act of 1994, and Petroleum and Geothermal Energy Operations Laws. At the March 2021 election, the government committed to the work health and safety laws commencing in early January 2022, and the government is working towards that to meet its election commitments. The details on asbestos compliance are actually prescribed in the WHS regulations, and compared to our current legislation, they are more detailed, and as such, we do not call up the codes of practice in the new WHS regulations. Codes of practice, however, will be produced and they can be used in proceedings to decide on whether a duty under the OHS legislation has been met. So what we'll be covering today, you can see on the slide there, is asbestos management, demolition and refurbishment, Class A and Class B removal and asbestos related work. There's a webinar coming up on Thursday this week that will cover asbestos licensing amongst other things like authorizations and permits. And I encourage you to dial into that for specific information on that topic. Okay, so let's move on to asbestos management. So that's covered in part 8.3 of the WHS regulations. And essentially it hasn't really changed much, but as I said, the details in the legislation or in the regulations are more detailed. So all asbestos containing material or ACM at the workplace must be identified. If a material cannot be identified, but a competent person believes it to be ACM, then it has to be assumed to be asbestos, not the other way around. In addition, if part of a workplace is inaccessible and likely to contain ACM, then it must be assumed that asbestos is present in that workplace. Samples have to be analyzed by a NATO accredited laboratory. The presence and the location of the ACM must be identified and labelled where reasonably practicable. As I mentioned, principles are still the same. So the asbestos register, there has to be an asbestos register. It needs to be kept at the workplace, readily accessible. The information must be kept up to date. And there needs to be detail on the date on which the ACM was identified, the location, the type and the condition. The asbestos management plan needs to be maintained. It should be clear and unambiguous. The management plan or the asbestos management plan is the total system. It should set out the aims of a plan, what's going to be done, when it's going to be done and how it's going to be done. The asbestos management plan must be written and include identification of the ACM, decisions and reasons about the, um, the ACM and the management of asbestos in the workplace, 
procedures for detailing incidents or emergencies in relation to ACM. And again, readily accessible to workers, health and safety representatives, and persons conducting a business or undertaking. Sorry, I'll just be croaky. Um, and those persons conducting your business or undertaking, we refer to them as PCBUs. In terms of reviewing the plan, it has to be reviewed when there is an update or a review of the asbestos register or a control measure, when asbestos is removed or remediated, if the plan is no longer deemed adequate, if a health and safety representative requests a review, or at least every five years. Okay, let's move on to asbestos demolition and refurbishment, which is contained in part 8.6 of the WHS regulations. And this applies to demolition or refurbishment of a structure or plant constructed or installed before the 31st of December 2003. A person conducting a business or undertaking the PCBU has to review the asbestos register before demolition or refurbishment takes place and revise it if the register is inadequate. The PCBU must be given or obtain a copy of the asbestos register from the person with management or control of the workplace before demolition or refurbishment commences. The presence of asbestos must be determined prior to demolition or refurbishment. And this can be through an inspection or a pre-demolition pre survey by a competent person. For example, um, uncovering all hidden ACM. So for example, in walls or chimneys, um, knocking through to see if there's any friable lagging or insulation in those areas, taking up flooring to have a look if there's um, vinyl flooring there or glue or the friable backing underneath the vinyl flooring. And if asbestos is presumed to be present, then it has to be treated as if it is present. The regulations also stipulate that the PCBU undertaking the removal or the demolition work must inform the owner or the occupier of a residential property, or in any other case, the person with management or control of the works, workplace, that ACM is actually present. And as I mentioned, ACM must be identified and removed before demolition. In cases of emergency, and this does happen from time to time, so emergency occurs if a structure or plant is structurally unsound or um, collapse or structure of the plant is imminent. So in those sorts of cases, the person with management or control of the workplace needs to develop safe systems of work, having regard to the asbestos register where applicable. They'll also need to give written notice to the regulator immediately after they become aware of the emergency and before demolition is commenced. Okay, in regards to asbestos removal work, you can see the table there and what we've done is just highlight some of the main points. So we've got class A there, which we currently refer to as unrestricted work and class B, which we currently refer to as restricted work. So the supervisor for class A work has to be on site. For class B, they need to be readily available. For training, there are nationally accredited courses for the appropriate license. One of the biggest changes that we'll see in this space is notification. So currently it's seven days and we're moving across to five days, but also in this space, both unrestricted and restricted work has to be notified to the regulator. So that's unless it's non-friable and less than 10 square meters. There has to be a detailed methodology that details asbestos type and location and condition in an asbestos removal control plan for both class A and class B work. And as is now, signage barriers and um, decontamination facilities have to be present. Visual clearances for class A work are done by a licensed asbestos assessor, and this is a new type of license for us here in WA. And then for class B work by an independent competent person. Air monitoring is still required for Class A work and that has to be conducted by an LAA. And with Class B, if the independent competent person believes there's a risk. And clearance certificates are required before reoccupation for Class A, which is still the case now, um, and also for Class B. SWIMs are also required um, as this type of, of work, asbestos removal work is actually still classed as high risk construction work under WHS and the PCBU is responsible to make sure the removal list is appropriately licensed. Health risks related to licensed asbestos removal work and the need for health monitoring has to be given to the worker before work commences. The register has to be obtained prior to work commencing. 
and the license holder must inform the person with management or control of the workplace that the removal work is going to be carried out. And this also extends to residential premises. As I mentioned, um, LAAs are a new class of license for us here in WA and um, they obviously conduct the monitoring work for, um, for Class A and also can for Class B. Air monitoring has to be carried out immediately before work commences unless a glove bag method is used and also during removal. And the air monitoring results have to be given to workers at the workplace, to health and safety reps for workers at the workplace and the PCBU and other persons. And if it's a residential um, premises, um, you have to be given, that has to be given to the person that commissioned the work, the occupier, owner and other persons at the residence. Now in regards to LAAs, um, there will be a transitional arrangement in place as we are aware that potentially when WHS commences next year, there might not be a sufficient number of LAAs in WA. There'll also be transitional arrangements for other new training requirements for asbestos and these transitional arrangements will be published on the DEMERS website. Waste, moving on to waste, waste must be contained and labelled in accordance with the GHS. That's a globally harmonised system for classification and labelling of hazardous chemicals. We've had that system and also the approved criteria um, running in WA for a number of years now. And obviously with waste, no changes there. It has to be disposed of as soon as practicable after the removal has taken place and also um, at, a, at a licensed facility. So I'm just moving on to the next slide here. So in terms of the notification that I was talking about for both Class A and Class B work, we'll have a new online notification form. It will look something like that. Um, that's just the top part of the first page. The second page will have an area where you'll need to attach the relevant documentation. So that's things like your asbestos removal control plan and your safe work method statement. And this form will become available when the WHS laws commence. Okay, we'll move on to 8.9 now, which is related to asbestos related work. Alrighty, so asbestos related work means work involving asbestos other than removal, which is covered in part 8.7 that we just went through, that is permitted under regulation 419. So 419 currently stipulates that types of asbestos related work that are permitted are things like research and analysis, sampling and identification in accordance with the legislation, maintenance or service of non-friable ACM that was installed before the 31st of December 2003, management of asbestos in accordance with the legislation, and things like laundering of asbestos contaminated clothing in accordance with the legislation and soils based work as the slide mentioned. There's also some information related to NOA on naturally occurring asbestos that's managed by an asbestos management plan. So what does the PCBU need to do in regards to asbestos related work? Well, if there's uncertainty as to whether the work is asbestos related or not, then the PCB, PCBU actually has to take samples for analysis and have those analysed at a NARCH accredited laboratory. Before the person is engaged to carry out asbestos related work, the PCBU must provide information on the health risks and health effects associated with exposure to asbestos and the need for details of health monitoring for workers carrying out asbestos related work. If air monitoring is required, information needs to be readily accessible to workers and others affected, and a competent person needs to determine whether the workplace exposure standard has been exceeded. And if this is the case, the PCBU will then need to determine which workers and others may have been exposed and inform those that have been identified. Safe systems of work have to be in place, training has to be in place and facilities must be available to decontaminate the asbestos related work areas and the plant used and also for the workers involved. Nothing that's contaminated can be removed from the area unless it is decontaminated or sealed in a container that's correctly labelled and that includes things like PPE such as uh, reusable respirators. All right, so that was just a really quick summary. So we're ready for um, your questions now. So as Andrew said before, if you want to go to slido.com and type in the event code there, and we encourage you to ask plenty of questions and we'll do our best to, to answer what we can. 
And as I mentioned, on Thursday this week, there'll be a, um, a webinar coming up that will answer specific questions in relation to authorization. So that's licenses, permits and registrations. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, before we start with the questions, I'd just like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available uh, soon after this, uh, soon after um, the Safe Work Month is finished. So uh, you'll be able to access this uh, presentation, in fact, all of the other webinars as well uh, in the very near future. So the first question I have for you um, is asbestos containing dust, when is it Class A or Class B work? That's a, that's a really interesting question and very topical. So we get quite a lot of questions on that. So essentially, um, we have um, no line in the sand for that. Um, I know that, that people probably would prefer something that's concrete. However, it's on a case-by-case -case basis because every situation is going to be unique. Um, we recommend the involvement of a competent person to assess the extent of the contamination and then that will then determine whether it's Class A or Class B work. And um, there's also a Safe Work Australia document titled Minor Dust Contamination that we refer to to help with making that decision. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, only that obviously when we're talking competent person, we want someone that's got the appropriate training, knowledge and experience in dealing with that sort of matter as well, because they're the ones that make that assessment. So, and they just need to take into account all of the factors involved, including the amount of contamination, how long it's going to take to clean, all those sorts of things. Yeah. So that's why it's multifaceted, not easy to answer. Thank you. So the next question, what are the minimum training course requirements for site, for site staff other than licence holders and supervising, supervisors removing non-friable asbestos? Okay, so um, so as I mentioned um, on the slide that I showed up about, uh, there was a, a section, a little section on training. So we have um, some new nationally accredited courses that are nationally accredited across Australia and those will be the courses that we're looking at for this type of work. So I believe there's one for uh, restricted license for work, non-friable, non friable and supervisors, yeah. So they're actually defined in the Work Health and Safety Regulations as specified VET courses. So if you have a copy of the regulations, you can certainly go and have a look at that. Will WA be implementing their own licensed asbestos assessor qualifications through WorkSafe, or will they adopt other state assessors in relation to friable ACM? Okay, so my so LAAs or licensed assessors, assessors are new to the state, um, so a new licensing requirement there. Um, we'll be licensing them in this state, but my understanding is that um, we'll recognise LAAs that have got their licences in other states. And I believe we actually already have some in this state that are LAAs where they've got, been granted licences from the other states and territories. Thanks, Eve. The next question for you, is will you be providing anything like the UK's HSG 264 asbestos survey guide? Mm. Okay, so we are aware of it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. We've been talking um, internally about the information that we're, we're going to provide. And we'll need to provide quite a bit of information just to help people with what requirements they need to fulfill and that sort of thing and obviously that'll just help with the regulations and obviously help external know exactly what they need yeah, to do so, so if we've got something we yeah whether whether it's actual document or frequently asked question or something along those lines we'll hopefully be able to yeah so um it's a, it's a good question we will look at it and see if we if um that's something we can produce down the track um, like Val said, in like maybe fact sheets or Q and A's or something similar. So thank you for that. What qualifications do people who produce asbestos register need? Re, asbestos registers need. Okay, so um, at the moment, competent. competent person. So that's obviously the appropriate training, knowledge, and experience to to conduct those tasks. And we see at the moment that that's usually um, consultants that do that, whether they have a background in environmental um, health or um, occupational hygiene, that's normally what we see at the moment. Um, and I, I wouldn't expect that to change really in the space 
Val, what do you think? Um, I don't think it would change that much. And even if a person's um, licensed as an asbestos assessor, the other side to that is one of the qualifications is a building qualification. So they may not have a hygiene qualification, but they may have a building one. So it's someone that's obviously got that appropriate knowledge to be able to determine if asbestos is within inside a building or not. And um, just on that as well, Bill, before we move on to the next question, that presumption rule that I was talking about, sometimes that gets forgotten and it's clear in WHS, it might not be so clear in our current legislation, but in WHS there is a presumption rule. So if you presume it to be asbestos, you treat it as if it is, not the other way around, which is sometimes what we see at the moment. Can the asbestos management plan be, overarching, be an overarching document that covers multiple PCBU workplaces? Oh, that's a good question. I don't see, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if that question stems from, say, large organisations that have multiple locations. And I don't see in those sorts of circumstances, I don't see why not, as long as it's clear and unambiguous and it sort of, I guess, it keeps everything together in one um, area, but it sections it off into the different into the different buildings. We actually have that off. now. We've got a couple of them that have got asbestos management plans that cover multiple sites, and they just clearly uh, sp uh, spell out location, whatever, and this is the details, location. So it just clearly stipulates what location it is, but the overarching document is one. I would imagine, though, that um, just because you have the overarching document, if there are any peculiarities between the workplaces, they would still have to be identified. Absolutely, they would be identified. Yep. And the thing is, um, as well, those plans have to be readily accessible. So whilst there might be, say, one head office that, that governs multiple locations, you would expect the plan, or we would expect the plan to be at each of those locations and readily accessible. And again, that also means any time there's a change on one location, that document would need to be revised. Are there any templates available for asbestos plans? Management plans, I presume. We currently don't have anything on our website. I'm trying to think if um, Safe Work Australia has anything. Potentially, are you aware, Bill? So the contents of the uh, management plans are prescribed in the regulations. They it's are. really quite clear. So um, while we don't have a particular form, the content of the plan is there. And obviously, it's up to the PCBU to determine the, how they fill those forms in, providing the various elements are, are satisfied. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure there may be something in the codes of practice. Poss I'm, I'm sort of thinking more asbestos register related mm -hmm. because there are, I know there are um, examples of asbestos registers out there. The register is part of the plan, obviously. Um, but I'm not, I, I don't remember seeing a plan, an asbestos management plan template mm -hmm. when I've been looking through sort of the drafts and things like that, so. But the, yes, okay, so the con anyway, the message there is the content is clearly identified in the regulations. Um, with the implementation of the new training requirements, mm -hmm. uh, remove non-friable asbestos, has WorkSafe inspected audited the current training organisations? So um, the responsibility for the quality of the training, in fact, rests with the VET regulator in Western Australia. So that's uh, the Training Accreditation Council. Um, or the uh, Australian, School, uh, Australian Skills Quality Authority. Thank ASQA. You, yes. ASQA. 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 ASQA, yes. Yep. Um, so um, they are responsible for ensuring the quality of the training provided by the uh, VET sector. Um, so if you have any concerns, by all means, raise your concerns directly with those two, uh, those two regulators. Um, the next question is, many remote and rural buildings have asbestos. How is this material expected to be removed when cost of getting suitably trained persons will be very expensive. Hmm. That's yeah. That that's quite a difficult <laughs> question to answer. Regional Australia, where it's it's vast, mm. we're aware that it's difficult to get services to remote communities and things like that. Um, we often deal with um, government agencies like Department of Housing and Department of Lands and Heritage in regards to this sort of matter. Um, yeah, I don't really have an answer to that. Yeah, so in terms of the regional costs, et cetera, obviously we're aware that it is a perpetual problem for the regional uh, community, um, but there's no simple solution to that particular cost. Mm. 
Can you please break down specific differences, if any, compared to model work health and safety regulations related to asbestos management? So um, there was a slide on asbestos management um, in my quick summary. And really, the essentials in regards to asbestos management are the same as they, as they are now. Um, there really isn't any major differences apart from that the detail regards to in regards to asbestos management is actually in the regulations and I, I went through that earlier um, so it's clear about the presumption rule it's clear about the identification um, and uh, it details what needs to be in the asbestos management plan and it details what needs to be in the asbestos register the frequency of updates those sorts of things so the major difference i think is probably the five-year rule at the moment um but otherwise it's it's very similar in regards to detail at the moment the detail sits in the code of practice the management code of practice and moving forward the detail will sit in the regulations and the only other aspects would be the requirement for notification yes for non friable asbestos so that's removal and, right yeah right yes yeah. and also the uh, training requirements where yes. um, participants change. must have completed a specified vet course so those are probably the main differences and there's a few other little ones too like the clearances for restricted work which we never had before so obviously all class b now are going to have to have a clearance which they never had to previously um, that was dependent on whether the client wanted it but that'll be a, a regulation now that they'll have to have to comply with uh, will demurs be producing any guidance material including do's and don'ts for managing asbestos in customers homes for people who deliver aged care services Ooh. Okay, all right. So um, we thank you for that because that is oh, that's probably one of the first questions I've ever had in that in that space. Um, so I think what we would do there is we can maybe potentially look at an FAQ on that and put that on our FAQs. But really, um, the residential premises because we get this in aged care facilities as well, but we also get this in residential homes where carers are going in. Um, and so the principles of asbestos are, if you don't disturb it in any way, then the exposure potential is greatly reduced. Um, but we can look at that and put, we'll, we'll take that on notice and potentially put something up on an FAQ. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> Given all asbestos requires sign off by an independent by an independent person, presumably, to the removalist, how will this be policed by WorkSafe? So, um, can you read that again? Yes. Sign, sign yes. off, sign off. Given all asbestos work requires sign off by an independent person Clearance. to the removalist, how will this be policed by WorkSafe? Hmm, all righty. So, I think the issue with the structure of the work health and safety regulations is the duties are actually on the workplace participants to make sure that there is compliance. Obviously, if there are issues that come to our attention and they can come um, either through proactive inspection by my learned colleagues, um, or we can re certainly receive advice. But as I say, the structure of the work health and safety laws is that it's up to the workplace participants to make sure there is compliance in the first instance. And uh, there's things like health and safety reps um, and uh, health and safety committees, which can be used to facilitate these sorts of services. So we are obviously a regulator, but the primary focus is to ensure that the workplace is safe and we would encourage the workplaces to um, um, self-police in, in the initial circumstances, but obviously if issues can't be resolved, um, we're happy to have it referred to uh, to the demurs and our inspectors will consider the issues. So one of the things that we mentioned earlier was that all work is notifiable, so restricted and unrestricted. And so as a result, we will be looking at work across the board so we currently obviously engage with our stakeholders now in both spaces but the restricted space up until whs come, uh, legislation comes in wasn't notifiable it will be mm. and so then when we go out and we assess the work practices of our license holders we will be looking at clearances as well mm. and then obviously we'll get matters raised with us by um by the general public as well and in those instances we'll also be addressing correct work practice and clearances too 
And that would be one of the things that obviously at some point auditing would look at when it comes to licence requirements, where they'd be sitting there going, okay, you've done X number of jobs, there's your ticketing dockets, there's your clearances. So there's a, it has to marry up. And just on that auditing function, so that will change slightly. So historically, we've been looking at that um, more sort of a, through a desktop desktop type based audit, and we'll be moving over to um, site based audits as well, just to ensure that there is compliance with safe removal work practice. From a construction viewpoint, what will be the expectations on a PCBU when it comes to their staff drilling holes in surfaces? that made the ACN? Yeah, so that's that's a good question as well. So we, of, we often see that now with sort of, we, we call that minor asbestos work. And I think the terminology that, that we use in the WHS is asbestos related work, which were the last two slides. So um, in my mind, the, the principles haven't changed um, and won't change. So if asbestos is a hazard within your work environment, it needs to be treated as such. And as such, there has to be um, some, I guess, awareness training and some information provided to workers so they have an understanding if they're doing some drilling work or they're, you know, fixing a light or running a cable or something like that, that they have some pre-information that makes them more aware that the material that they're working with potentially could be asbestos. And as a result, they need to actually implement safe systems of work. And add to that. that would also include things like wearing the right PPE and, and all that sort of thing as well. So one of the, the big things that we find with um, PPE is masks with people not being clean shaven. So the whole thing is if you're going to wear a mask, you really need to be clean shaven, otherwise it makes the mask ineffective. So people need to be aware of that as well when they're doing that sort of work. And then obviously the duty of care um, level or responsibility is still there. So um, training, awareness and correct supervision. Are order periods going to move to five years like the Eastern States? And if so, the reason for this given asbestos is a product where the conditioning is not improving. Sorry, I'll... That was, are, about, that was about five years. Yes. Yeah. So are order periods going to move to five years like the Eastern States? And if so, the reason for this given asbestos is a product where the condition is not improving. So the audits oh, are yeah, so you... okay, the audits are five years. Um, in terms of why five years, the work health and safety laws are consistent throughout all of Australia. Um, and this was one of the um, this was the period, if you like, agreed to by the work health and safety uh, ministers. Um, in terms of deterioration of asbestos over a five year period. I think um, Eva's covered that, perhaps not directly in her presentation, but you have a duty to make sure you monitor the condition hmm. of your asbestos. Absolutely, so, yeah. Eva and Val, want to add anything more? So that's, um, that's part of the register, because the register has to um, stipulate the condition of the actual material itself. And um, the management plan needs to consider removal because we've, especially in WA, we've got some really aged infrastructure, which is reaching the end of its life. And obviously asbestos, when it's old, it does weather. And so the risk increases. So that's the whole point of having a register and then a plan, because the plan is saying, right, this is a higher risk, therefore we'll remove that first or we'll remediate that first or we'll encapsulate that first. So it's all part of that management system. And I also think like in relation to the auditing side of it, if um, any of the licence holders have actually had any dealings with the WorkSafe inspectors in the last 18 months, two years, they would know that we are doing things a little bit differently where we go out on site and have a look, but then we're also asking for all that documentation as well in relation to that work that they were doing. So we're asking for the control plans, we're asking for the swims, we're asking for the training records, we're asking for disposal, which is sort of like a semi-audit anyway, but we're asking in particular about that job that they're that we were involved in. Thank you. The next question, who is responsible for identifying and removing any present ACM under 8.6? Is it the building contractor before commencing work or the building owner? So removal specifically. So who is responsible for identifying it I in the first place? Identifying is it. Is it the PCBU? Yeah. Uh, or is it the building contractor or the um, owner. owner of the building? 
that would depend on who's doing, if we're talking commercial or res, uh, residential. If we're talking commercial, then it's the PCBU conducting the removal work. Uh, sorry, for it's residential, we're talking the person conducting the removal work because you don't expect an owner to provide a register. So the removalist has to have a, um, the process for identification prior to commencing work. If we're talking commercial, then the, the commercial owner of that property or person in control needs to make sure that they've got the register and it's provided to the person conducting the work. And I would imagine the builder or the, sorry, the, the person responsible for demolishing the site, even if they have that information or it's not available, they should be making checks themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's not one or the other. There are duties all the way along. Yeah. yeah. Right. For naturally occurring asbestos, fibrous minerals in a mining setting, how will current controls regs change around that? Will mine site oc hygiene be LAAs? Oh. Okay. So I've got to say I'll, I'll own it right up front. Um, Mining is not our area, so we'll take that on notice. Definitely though, in terms of NOA or naturally occurring asbestos, it has to be part of their management plan. So at the moment, I think they call it a, high, a health hygiene management plan, HHMP. But in the new world, it's referred to as, um, I think it's asbestos, asbestos management plan. plan. Yeah. And so it has to be managed through that. And um, the essentials are the same. So risk assessment, um, every situation is going to be unique. So, for example, if you're in a, in a certain area 12 months prior, there could have been movement of that material through the alluvial floodplains and things like that. So it has to be done at the time that the work's um, being conducted. I think we'll take that one on notice and we'll, we'll ask our colleagues. Yes, so yeah. um, the mining um, had, their had their webinar last week. There may be some information in that, but um, we'll certainly... Um, keep that in mind and uh, produce any material that we can to clarify those issues um, as we move on. Will it be up to the LAA to determine the air monitoring requirement for friable works, removal works, such as pre, during, post air monitoring or prescribed requirements? For friable, they have to, it, it actually states in the regulations that they've got to do pre, during mm. and, and after. And so that is, hasn't changed. It hasn't changed and of, and um, the license holder goes to the LAA or goes to the consultant currently for that level of expertise to assist them with actually coming up with a system mm. for monitoring that suits that specific methodology. Yeah. Please explain type A and type B asbestos work. Okay. Shall I start? You want to start? You can. <laughs> okay. So class A is currently unrestricted. We refer to it as unrestricted work. So that's the removal of friable asbestos. Um, and there's a lower or a smaller group of asbestos license holders in that space at the moment. The risks are higher um, because of the friable nature of asbestos they're removing. And so that will then include things like the um, construction of enclosures under neg air, um, airlocks, decon facilities. So it's a sort of, I guess, a more specialised group. So that's class A. And class B, we currently refer to as the, our restricted licence group, and that's for non-friable. So that's like bonded asbestos, things like your fencing, your eaves, that sort of thing. Over 10 square metres. Yeah. Uh, what training or qualifications does an LAA need to hold? Okay, we sort of briefly mentioned that before. So, yeah, so there's a couple of different qualifications that a person can have, and obviously, part of that too is dependent on their experience and training and everything and skills. But some of the qualifications are examples like um, having a, a, a qualification in hygiene, a qualification in building, environment, environmental, those sorts of things. Right. So, that's clearly spelt out in the regulations as well what qualifications are required yeah. for that. And you must, and to be competent, you must also have the experience to make those sorts yeah. of decisions. Yes, as well. yes, yes. And I, so I think you've got to actually demonstrate it, that as well. You do have to demonstrate that. I think. Yep. Is it th yep. uh, I think it's three three years. So mm -hmm. sorry, I, I obviously don't know the detail specifically. Do you remember? No. Okay. Sorry. Okay. We'll pop that in the. Um, but they've got to have the that will be <laughs> <the right> material <laughs> yep. anyway. Um, is an A. RCP needed for every non friable asbestos removal job? Um, so, yes, it is. The asbestos removal control plan is required for 
both friable and non-friable work, yes. Will WorkSafe accept operatives with P403, P404, or even certificate of competence from the BOHS, or do you still need an LAA? Oh. I think we're probably stunned by the acronyms. We are actually. I'm aware of those. Um, I'm aware of those doc of those, of those courses, courses that um, did, so they're. Um, Qualifications from is it BOHS? Did yeah. it say bo that's the British Occupational Hygiene Society. They're quite comprehensive courses, but I'm not. I'm actually not sure. Is that more of a licensing question for Thursday? Um, yes, you can ask that question on Thursday, and we'll hopefully have an answer for you. You then. But do we know what the P403 is and the P? There, I think they're the BOHS courses. Oh, no, okay. Well, yeah. perhaps if the uh, uh, person asking the question can provide those details, we might be able to provide um, an answer for you on Thursday. Um, will there be an update to the approved code of practice? So the answer, the answer to that is yes. Um, the, there will be two uh, codes of practice. Um, the codes of practice are already available as model codes of practice through Safe Work Australia website. Um, the Commission um, for Occupational Safety and Health is reviewing the uh, model codes of practice. And while there'll be some changes made to those uh, codes of practice to reflect Western Australia's unique conditions and our laws, by and large, um, they will be very similar. So uh, yes, there'll be two codes of practice, um, again, in relation to asbestos. Um, will there be a comparison tables made available between differences between the OSH Act and the Work Health and Safety Act, particularly in relation to regs and, and asbestos management? We've already had a question about the differences which we've uh, talked about. Um, there are something like um, 700 regulations, 400 pages of regulations, there's about 300 uh, pages of um, Work Health and Safety Act. So I think getting a direct comparison from all aspects is um, probably beyond our resources, um, but we will be highlighting some of those differences um, in our guidance material as much as possible. And Eve's already run through of some of the main ones in relation to asbestos. But I think generally speaking, the work health and safety laws are based on existing um, occupational safety and health laws. The old codes of practice from NOSC, uh, NOSH have been adopted generally within the work health and safety laws. So there's not going to be that much, that many changes apart from the ones that we've uh, that we've discussed so far. Would you like to add anything? Not really. No. That's, yeah. um, what is WorkSafe definition of an independent competent person. Mm. <laughs> so generally the independent competent person, um, it's up to the PCBU to make that particular determination. Um, and it's not just in relation to asbestos, it's throughout the entire work health and safety laws, there is a reference to an independent competent person. Um, but the PCBU has the duty to make sure things are done safely. So at the end of the day, the PCBU has the duty to make sure that person is competent and there are safe systems of work provided. So in the asbestos area, when we talk in competent person, we've already talked about a couple, um, a couple of times today so far that they need to have the appropriate training skills and experience. Um, and I believe that's got a, a year time tied to it in the regulations for asbestos. The other thing that comes up with asbestos is the word independent. So independent means they are not part of the removal process. So they're not part of the company that is actually doing the removal work. So that's how you get your independent person. So so um, yes, so essentially they're not in any way affiliated to the licensed removal company. They are independent and you can obviously see if there wasn't independence there's a potential for conflict. So it's trying to basically reduce that conflict. Is separate notification required for asbestos if it is part of a demolition notification? Yes. Currently, we have that system in place, and that, as far as I know, that will be the system moving forward. Yeah. If you work for a local government authority and manage the register, is there some training you can do to conduct the basic assessments? So that's around potentially becoming competent to to do to do an assessment of the ACM within those within that that I guess that portfolio is that I presume that's what they're asking. So. 
perhaps in a larger organisation, you might have someone come in and do an assessment. There's two functions there. One is identification of mm -hmm. the asbestos, yeah. and the other one is management of, yeah. of mm -hmm. the register. Yep. And I think you already talked about if there's any doubt, assume it is. Yes. So I think in terms of training, um, I'm aware of a multitude of um, training providers out there that provide this sort of thing. Um, and I advise you just to basically go onto Google and have a look. But I'd be looking for something that's detailed enough to improve your awareness of the potential for ACM. And if there's any doubt, if you don't have that expertise in-house, I'd always be looking to a consultant or a contractor to assist me with that knowledge. And many local governments have actually got people in-house that have asbestos training of some description, whether it be the environmental health officers or their building services area that do assessments prior to demolition. Mm -hmm. Um, can you please explain the implications for a PCBU having control of a known asbestos contaminated site, asbestos contamination in soil? Oh, okay. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> Soils is a bit of an emerging issue for us. Um, it sort of reminds me a little bit of the asbestos containing dust space. Again, we can't draw a line in the sand. Essentially, um, with asbestos contaminated soils, we have a fact sheet on our website um, and it, it basically says that every situation is going to be unique. Competent person needs to help you with the assessment to deem whether there's friable, non-friable, I guess the extent of the contamination. Yeah, things yeah. like how old it is, like the history of the site, um, you know, has it been there for 20 years under under the surface, has it, is it a new contamination, all those sorts of things all come into play. But ultimately, contaminated sites don't fall under our remit, they fall under um, Department, Department of Health, yeah. Health and DeWer, and Department of Health actually have a guideline that they've produced in relation to contaminated soils. And so the contaminated soils guidelines that Val referred to can be used as a guideline to help with the assessment of the contaminate or the potential um, level of contamination. But um, from our perspective, we don't ever want it to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So the sorts of things that we get involved in uh, with in terms of complaints, I guess, are related to inadequate removal that has led to a contaminated site. So if the work removal work is done properly, then we're not ever going to get to this point. And the other side to that is obviously our involvement too would be the license holder that's then doing the work. So if um, someone's assessed it and basically said that it's um, non-friable contamination, then a, and it's more than 10 square metres due to the area it's um, contaminated, then obviously a restricted license holder does the work. But if it's a small contained area that's less than 10 square metres, then a person may not need a license. So that all comes down to whatever the competent person that assesses it. Um, determines and then obviously part of that is the friability because the minute they say it's friable it then becomes a class A license holder. Mm -hmm. Will it be illegal for homeowners to carry out any work on asbestos within an existing structure? So um, domestic dwellings, residential premises outside of our jurisdiction um, that sort of thing is more in the public health space, so that's um, the environmental health officers at local government authorities that are delegated to administer the um, health asbestos regulations. So I, I, we can't really answer that question. I do know obviously at the moment um, there is concern about the number of renovators, that are sort of homeowners that are doing their own renovations and maybe not having the knowledge that their dwellings contain asbestos. But again, it's sort of beyond our yeah. control. And this was... of, I was going to say a couple of conversations I've had with our colleagues in the health department. Um, they are concerned about some of these home renovations. And I think that they would suggest in the strongest possible terms that if you're dealing with asbestos, the best thing you can possibly do is get a professional to come along and um, mm -hmm. undertake the work for you. It is a hazardous substance. Um, and um, throughout the community, there are many people who have uh, have suffered. And that is the line they definitely push. Local government pushes the same sort of um, scenario through their environmental health officers. The other thing is uh, the Department of Health has a lot of documentation in relation to home renovations as well. Mm. So that's always available for people to access. On their website, that's good. Yep. 
Um, we're coming towards the end of our presentation, um, so if I can just uh, let you know that we're still receiving lots of questions. Uh, we may not get to them all, we'll do our best, um, and of course we'll keep those questions um, to help us form some of the guidance material that we will be producing. So by all means keep asking the questions um, and we will continue on our merry way and get through as many as we can. With the mention of P2 respirators, will there be stronger emphasis on fit testing health surveillance for workers, especially for friable ACM removal work? So um, at the moment, um, we, we go pretty hard in this space with fit testing. Um, there is information on our website around fit testing and fit checking. Um, obviously, if we're going to wear P2 type respirators, reusable, disposable, whatever it looks like, um, Fit testing ensures the best fit and the maximum effectiveness of that. So it is a requirement, yes. Is it the duty of the demolition PCBU to identify identify ACM in an, ex, in an inaccessible area as an intrusive testing a prescribed requirement? Yes, so I did mention that earlier. So, so refurbishment and demolition um, we would expect an intrusive survey. You're going to demolish the building, which means you're not you're not actually maintaining the structure. So, like I said, we'd expect people to be looking behind cavities. We'd be looking. We'd be expecting um, the um, removing of tiled areas to look if there's asbestos line boards, be, you know, behind that pulling up carpet, looking if there's vinyl floor tiles. So you're demolishing the building anyway, so we would definitely mm. expect some level of intrusive survey to identify the ACM that needs to be removed prior to the demolition. And there should be an asbestos register in England, shouldn't there? Well, it depends on the premises. So, not, you know, obviously with the residential premises, not necessarily, but with the commercial, definitely. So, but I guess the short answer there is yes, we would, we would expect an intrusive survey. Will the client be required to engage the removalist and LAA independently, or will it be permitted for the removalist to still engage the LAA? That's a really good question, because that sort of relates back to the independence. Okay. So um, true independence would be the client engaging, not the license holder engaging. Do you want to add to that? Um, the, the problem that we've got there is quite often a client doesn't necessarily know who they could go to. So what some of the licence holders do do now is they'll actually provide them a, a couple of company names and then the client will pick one of those. So if you're doing that sort of thing, then yes, they are truly independent. We have not seen ARCPs for non-friable work unless it's done by an unrestricted licence holder. Yeah. From what date will a restricted license holder have to start using them? Okay, so um, will there uh, uh, that I guess a transition period? Will there be a transition period for that, or will it be? So when the work health and safety laws commence, they they will be required. Um, the WorkSafe Western Australia Commissioner, who will be the regulator, has um, indicated there will be a recognition that um, these are new laws, and there will be um, recognition of that in the functions of our inspectors, um, but clearly there's an expectation that um, from the from the commencement, these uh, these requirements will be met. Um, and while there will be some flexibility, uh, it will certainly not be a get get out of jail um, option for people that we expected to move on as quickly as possible to comply with the work health and safety laws. And just on that, we'll be communicating with our stakeholders, including our licensed groups, to advise them of that sort of uh, change. With Friable Works, does an email interim clearance suffice as a, as a certification of reoccupation, or does the PCB re, PCBU require formal certificate before LARC demobilises? Okay. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just needs to be written. So if it's an email, that would be considered written, providing it meets all the elements that they're required as part of the clearance. So obviously, if, if part of that is air monitoring, then obviously they need to provide the air monitoring results as well as the, the comments saying that there's no asbestos seen and, and all that sort of stuff. So as long as they have got all that detail in the email, then that would be sufficient. Is an asbestos register required to be maintained once all asbestos has been removed from the workplace? Mm. 
I don't think, uh, well, first of all, I haven't seen that instance yet. We're not there yet, but there might be some out there. But if there is no um, ACM, then a register is not required as far as I'm aware. But obviously, historically, you'll have those records that have identified that you've had ACM previously, you've, you've got your asbestos management plan that's shown the removal. Um, so, yeah. Um, with these upcoming changes, will there be more inspectors to undertake compliance activities? And how many asbestos compliance notices have been issued recently? Oh, okay. Ooh. So, um, two questions there, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, my team is growing, so we're currently recruiting um for new asbestos specialist inspectors um so yes that's the first part of that question the second have you, part have you issued very many notices have you issued we, more notices yes we have hmm. yeah so um currently in my team i can't give you a number on notices but we're definitely issuing them um we're doing a couple of things in that space at the moment so we've got a proactive campaign running at the moment across a couple of teams in regards to asbestos and asbestos management asbestos removal and we've also we obviously get the complaints that come in yeah so across that board where we identify breaches we are issuing notices can we encapsulate it or do we have to remove by encapsulation i'm talking about a metal wrap around pipework I'm a, I, yeah, I'm aware of encapsulation, but yep. thank you for the clarification. Yeah, so um, so I think it's dependent on the situation. So that's part of the asbestos mm -hmm. management plan is actually highlighting your areas of risk and actually coming up with a remediation plan. So either encapsulation or removal. Clearly, um, in my mind, I think removal is your best option, <laughs> especially prefer. with aging infrastructure. Like I said, the older it gets, the more it's deteriorating. So I would always, if I was doing it, I would always have that as your best option. Then the hazard has been uh, dealt with, it's gone and it doesn't need to be um, managed. The problem with encapsulation is whilst it's been encapsulated, your plan in your register will actually show that. If you need to get access to that environment, there's always the potential for exposure down the track. Is the online notification form for any removal or for more than 10 square meters? So um, the notification form is for, for license is work. For license work. So class more than a, 10 square meters. Yeah, class A and class B. Um, can you advise on supervisors on a class B license? Do they have to be on site or within a certain distance? So the, the regulations actually talk about being readily available. Mm -hmm. So um, that means they don't have to be on site because readily available can also be via phone. So obviously um, we'd love for them to be on site. However, um, that may not be a practical option. So as long as they are available for communication, that's the, the main thing from I that think, point. Yeah, and I think the caveat on that is um, whilst the legislation for Class B says readily available, we want to make sure that there is a good level of supervision mm -hmm so that the work is being done correctly and in accordance with um, safe systems and the requirements of the legislation. Where no asbestos is identified on a survey, is new documentation going to guide industry that an AMP is still required, i.e. for refer demo purposes? Where no asbestos identified, on, so okay, so where there's no, no asbestos identified at a workplace, what documentation do they require is how I read that and are we going to provide any? So I think if the answer is there's no uh, asbestos identified at a workplace, um, you've got the documentation to say that that's really all it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's required. Yeah, that's required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, currently there are a number of interstate LAAs in WA. Will their details be listed on the WorkSafe WA website? even though they are not licensed in WA? So that's definitely a licensing question to be handled on Thursday. But as I mentioned, um, if you are an LAA or if there are LAAs that have got their license in other states, they can they can work here. I don't know the answer to that specific one. So we'll take that on notice and um, we'll provide an answer to that on Thursday. Okay, so we've uh, come to the end of our presentation. We're just about run out of time. In fact, I think we're a little bit over. First of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance uh, today um, and uh, we would encourage you uh, if you have any more questions about asbestos licensing 
um, to uh, tune in on Thursday or on the screen there, there's some contact details for you. And if you aren't already, we would encourage you to subscribe to the WorkSafe um, website um, and we'll be providing information about the work health and safety laws um, through that website and our, uh, and our newsletters. So thank you one and all. Thank you, thanks.